Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's uh, MLA Productivity and Profitability webinar. Uh, these webinar series are designed to deliver topics pertinent to sheep and beef producers. My name is Hilary uh, and I am the uh, work for the facilitators of these webinars, Aggregate Consulting. Tonight we have uh, Jess Richards and Jeff Casburn of the New South Wales DPI office um, talking to us about adjusting the percentage of merino ewes joined to terminals. Um, so thanks for jumping on Jess and Jeff. Um, in, a fortnight in a fortnight's time, we will be joined by uh, Stu Bull of the MLA Markets team, who is going to be taking us through the current state of the uh, Australian cattle market. Just some housekeeping to get started with. Uh, this control panel will be at the top right corner of your screen. There is a red arrow uh, on the left of that control panel that collapses and reinstates it. You should be able to hear us, but we cannot hear you. Please type your questions in the box provided uh, and I will relay them to Jess or Jeff at the end of the webinar. Just to introduce tonight's presenters, we have Jess Richards, who is a Livestock uh, Research Officer with New South Wales DPI and is based at the Orange Agricultural Institute. Over the last 15 years, she has done a lot of work in the area of precision livestock, focusing on managing animals according to their level of production or risk rather than managing all animals as one flock. Throughout her time in this position, she has developed and supported many software tools in both decision support and operational to help producers understand their breeding objectives, uh, optimise their flock structures and target the correct markets for their products. These tools focus on both current generation improvement and the longer term genetic improvement, aiming to increase productivity, manage risks and maximise economic output. Jeff has worked for New South Wales DPI for more than 20 years in Goulburn, Burke and Wagga Wagga. He has well uh, developed knowledge of livestock and cropping systems and the interactions between enterprises. He has a keen interest in livestock production from pasture and a sound experience in drought feeding systems and lamb feedlotting. Jeff has a focus on both wool and meat enterprises and is passionate about agriculture and the rural community. So we're very lucky to have Jess and Jeff this evening. Uh, so I will make Jess our presenter. That should be coming up on your screen now, Jess. Just remember to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I forgot, thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Perfect, thanks Jess. Great. Thanks, Hilary, for the introduction. Um, and first of all, I would also like to thank MLA um, for the opportunity to present as part of the Productivity and Profitability webinar series. So thank you. All right. Um, now, we've been asked to talk on adjusting the percentage of merino use mated to terminal sires. Um, there may be many reasons why you might be doing this. Um, some of the main ones might be rebuilding a flock um, as part of drought recovery, taking advantage of different markets um, in response to feed availability, possibly expanding or decreasing an enterprise. In this presentation, I will cover some things to consider and also some tools that might help with some of these decisions in relation to adjusting these percentages. So just as an outline, and my screen has frozen. There we go. <laughs> um, just as an outline, um, we'll look at the number of ewes that are available to make to maternal or terminal size. Um, we don't want to just go out and adjust the percentage according to a great meat market to find out at marking time that we don't have enough merino lamb replacements. So I'll just have a quick look at the impact of reproduction and the number of age classes in a flock and run through a tool that can help you look at the numbers for your own flock. I'll then um, just go into um, some options about which ewes should be mated to which sire groups, because it's not just about the numbers. So a bit of a reminder about the ewe variability within a flock and run through another tool, a tactical tool that can help with drafting and allocating those animals to those sire groups. At the end of my presentation, I'll hand over to Jeff Casburn briefly for some broader considerations outside of these tools and what I cover. 
Okay, so the first slide um, is going to look at how we can identify the maximum number of animals that we can make to terminal size. So what this table is showing is uh, a range of reproduction um, levels of our flock on the left hand side. So let's just focus and say if our reproduction was 80% in our flock, we'd look at across this row in the table highlighted. Across the top is the number of adult age classes, or you can think of that as the number of lambings. So if we say we have three lambings, um, the crosshairs here land at 8%, which is telling us in this table that there are 8% animals available or surplus ewes available in our flock that we can either cull or make to terminal size. So we can obviously increase our number of age classes and change those figures, but we'll look at different reproduction percentages, et cetera. So what that's telling us is we need, under that scenario, we need 92% of the animals from our Merino matings to maintain our self-replacing flock, which leaves us with 8% available surplus ewes that we can make to terminal size. This also depends on other factors such as mortality and culling rate. So therefore calculating this maximum number to terminal size can be a bit tedious. However, we have a tool that can simplify this process for you and does the number crunching for your own particular flock. So this is what it looks like. It's called the Merino versus Terminal Sire flock model. And this was developed by Andrew Swan and Matt Kelly many years ago with funding from the Sheep CRC. And what we do here is enter some basic flock parameters up the top, right, uh, top left of the screen here. So the size of the breeding flock, weaning percentage and culling rate and mortality rates there. What we can do is click on this break even button here and this tells us the maximum number that we can mate to terminal sire. So what it's telling us is basically if we have 2000 ewes, um, we can have 66% uh, of the flock required to maintain our self-replacing merino flock, leaving us with the maximum of 34% that we can make to a terminal sire. Now, if we choose to mate more animals to a terminal sire, we can come in and change this figure to 50% manually. And what the tool then is able to do is tell us how many animals we will be short to keep maintaining our self-replacing merino flock. So when we are short of those animals, we might um, buy them in to make up those flock numbers. And we need to consider things such as the biosecurity on our farm, the bloodlines that we've built over the number of years, and also um, possible shortages of the number used to buy in and the dollars that it costs to do that. Maybe we want to avoid being um, short those animals and we could look at changing a few things in our flock, such as increasing the number of age classes. So if we then go in and into this section here and change the number of lambings to five, we can see the impact that that will have on our flock. So we press the break even button again, and now we can see with the same number of ewes, but with an additional age class, we now need less merino replacements, which means we have more animals available to mate to terminal sire. So this tool is useful um, to explore some of your options. And it's also useful over on this side to tell you how many animals will be in each age class. So if we have 2000 ewes, we split them at 46% to terminal size. We can see the allocation of those ewes, how they are distributed across the age classes and how many animals we will have as a result of that. So the other way we can look at it is if we decide we actually only want to mate 30% to terminal sire, we type that in and it can then tell us how many surplus animals we have available. So we've mated 30% to terminal sire, we've got enough um, using our self-replacing flock here and we have an additional 131 surplus ewes left over um, that aren't required to maintain numbers. This is um, obviously very use useful if we're trying to rebuild a flock, we can allocate more animals back into that merino flock. We might want to make use of more animals um, in the meat flock and make them to terminal size, or we might want to sell those to get some additional cash. So we've thought about the numbers that are available to make to terminal size. 
So if we've selected our rams already, now we know the proportions that we want to mate them, we're right to go, yeah? <laughs> All right, so everyone knows the value in selecting their rams. Um, some might choose the stud source and some might speed up the progress by actively seeking out the best rams within a stud or across a stud. Because one ram has a much larger genetic impact over a flock than one ewe, the ewes are often forgotten about a little bit. So I just want to bring this table back in um, that has been shown quite a few number of times. It's quite old, but it's quite valuable. If we are looking at selecting our animals for a wool flock, we look up here and we can see that fibre diameter on average is 20.4 in our flock. However, if we look at the top 25% of that flock and the bottom 25% of that flock, we can see there is a three micron difference between those animals. So yes, genetics are very important. I'm certainly not downplaying the choice of rams. It is very important. But there are also other opportunities for gain, such as the multiple fleeces that are produced across a lifetime from each ewe. We can gain immediate benefit from selecting these more productive ewes, and this can complement the progress that we make from the rams and add additional genetic gain as well. So if we go back to this table that we were looking at before, if we have fixed age classes, then the scenario that we used before, if we had 80% reproduction, means that we can have three age classes of animals and we will have enough animals in the flock to maintain a self-replacing merino flock. If we have no use selection, this means we are getting the latest genetics from our rams because we are getting the youngest animals. And as I said, we're maintaining our self-replacing flock. However, after looking at that table of variation in the ewes, it's no longer just about whether we have enough ewes, but the question is, do I have the ability to achieve gain through selecting those hoggett ewes? So if we have 8% surplus animals, which was that 80% reproduction and three age classes leaves us with 8% surplus animals. We're basically keeping all of our use, which doesn't allow for any of that selection opportunity. So if we aim to retain 50% of our surplus hoggett use, we can take advantage of that variation that we saw in the last slide. So that other 50% can go to our terminal sires. This means we're actively selecting the most appropriate use for us we're in, if we increase our age classes, we can increase our selection intensity and we also have more available to make to terminal size. So once we decide on the number of age classes and the proportions that we want to make to terminal sire, the next question is which use do I allocate to which sire group? So if we look at a drop of animals, this is just a, um, you know, a standard drop of animals. Um, in this particular flock, there's a mean fibre diameter of 17.2 micron. You can see the range um, of animals across this x-axis showing the fibre diameter for flock. We can also see a range in body weights on the y-axis here. Now, if we were to collect um, just one piece of information on those animals, such as a body weight, we could allocate the heaviest animals to make to terminal sire. So what does that look like? What we end up with is a group of animals up here that we allocate to the terminal sire that are 6.8 kilograms on average heavier than those animals that we allocate to the wool flock. So this hasn't changed the quality of wool in terms of fibre diameter in this flock. We're getting heavier ewes mated to terminal sires. However, we're not really getting any benefit for wool out of those wool allocated animals. So what if we collected, so we tagged our animals and collected fibre diameter measurements on, on those ewes. What we could do if our focus is on wool, on our merino flock for the wool animals, we could allocate the animals according to those fibre diameter measurements. So we keep our finest animals um, for the wool flock and use the broader fleeced animals for our terminal sire allocation. So um, once again, the animals that we've allocated to the meat flock are not actually according to higher body weights or anything like this. You can see we have the lightest animal allocated as well as the heaviest animal. So is there a better way to allocate those um, as a dual allocation strategy? And the answer is yes. 
um, so sorry, the benefit in the wool flock was 1.6 microns more than that in the meat flock. Okay, so if we select the animals this way, what we end up with is a group of animals that are better suited for wool and a second group that is better suited for meat allocation. So we've got finer animals here and heavier animals here. So we may lose a little bit of the advantage that could be achieved when selecting for a single direction, but now we have two valuable groups of animals selected for their targeted market. What if we were looking at culling some animals? So if we decided to cull our lightest animals, we'll find that we'll also be culling some of our lowest fibre diameter animals. If we only had the weight measurements on those animals and we culled our, oh sorry, so yes, if I culled the lightest animals, we'd be culling the finer animals as well sometimes. Okay, so if we were only using our fibre diameter measurements and we decided to cull the broader fleeced animals, we're also getting rid of some of our heavier animals. So is there a better way to do that? Yes, we can cull those animals that are both a high fibre diameter and a low body weight. That's 5% culling and that line just continues moving up as we increase that culling percentage to 10. So we have a line this way for our selection into the meat and wool groups, a line this way when we're looking at which animals to cull. Okay. So I'll just show that same information in a table because I want to look at a third trait and I can't really show that in, a, in the figure that I was looking at before. So first of all, what we see in this table is what we saw before. If we were only selecting on fibre diameter, we have a wool group that is much finer and a meat group that has no benefit for meat in terms of body weight. If we were to only use body weight as our selection strategy, we can get a group of animals that are heavier in body weight for the meat group, but there's no real benefit for wool. If we use the dual selection strategy that I showed on that selection on a diagonal, we get a group of animals that are finer in diameter in the wool flock and a group of animals that are heavier in body weight for the meat flock. What happens when we look at a third trait? In this case, the, the next likely trait that you'll possibly measure is fleece weight if we're looking at wool productivity. So you can see that when we select it on fibre diameter, because of the correlation with fleece weight, the negative correlation with fleece weight, we automatically get animals that have a lighter fleece. When we were selecting on body weight, body weight has a positive correlation with fleece weight. So as we select heavier animals into the meat group, we're also getting the heavier fleeced animals into the meat group. So our wool allocation animals are lighter fleeced. That is similar when we do the fibre diameter and body weight selection because we're selecting the heavier animals into the meat flock and we get a higher fleece weight in that group. So if we have that information, we can combine a fibre diameter and fleece weight selection strategy into one so that we can ensure that we not only increase fibre diameter, but we also increase fleece weight in that group that we want to allocate to our merino sire. So what we can see is we're getting a benefit, um, oh sorry, we're getting a slight increase in fibre diameter because we've added fleece weight into the selection strategy. However, now we're getting a big increase in fleece weight as well. So it's a more valuable um, dollar figure for that fleece group. I don't like using dollar figures because everyone puts their own dollar figures on how much value a fleece is, etc. cetera. Um, but what I've done here is look at five year average pricing and just to give a general indication of the benefit. Um, so the relativity between the different scenarios. So you can see as we've added fleece weight in, we get a much better fleece value. However, because we've now included fleece weight into our wool index, we do lose a little bit of body weight in our meat um, strategy. And you can see that's reduced quite a lot in the carcass value. So then we can go to a dual selection strategy where we look at combining fibre diameter and fleece weight in a fleece value selection for the wool flock and combine that with using body weight to select animals to go into the meat flock. 
So it's similar to this fibre diameter and body weight selection that we did before, except we're also incorporating fleece weight into this wool selection group. So what happens here? We're getting the same micron that we got with fleece value selection in our wool flock. We're getting a slightly lower fleece weight because we're now pulling some of those heavier animals into the meat group but it's still lighter than if we were only to use fibre diameter for selection into our wool flock. We are now getting a slightly lower fleece value in these animals because we've added in a body weight selection in the meat group, but it's still higher than a single fibre diameter selection that we had earlier. The positive thing is we are now getting an additional benefit in the meat group for body weight and that's also seen in a higher carcass value. So each additional included trait may decrease productivity change in a single trait, but this increases the overall productivity and profitability as we move towards our objective. This is moving closer to an index selection, however, that's out of the range of this tool. And this tool is a good place to start when you're looking at one or two or three traits to see the immediate benefit that you'll get between those allocations. However, if wool, wool is your main focus, dual selection may not be your best option. As we just saw, um, adding in a meat strategy or takes a little bit away from that wool flock. However, if that is what you decide to do to focus solely on the wool animals, this tool is a great thing, like going through this process allows you to compare the immediate outcomes of traits under different strategies to, to promote that thinking about possible options and impact of those decisions. So the next question is, once we decide on our strategy, how can we sort our animals into those draft allocations. Here's another tool that I will show you how to use, which you can have access to for free. What we do here is enter in our animal ID here. So your tag number of each U and any information that you have. So if you've micron tested those animals, you can enter their flat fibre diameter. If you have a body weight measurement, you can enter that here or a fleece weight measurement. Doesn't matter whether you have one, two or three of those measurements, you can enter it into this tool. What we do then is set some parameters here, such as fleece yield, dressing percentage and carcass price. We go down, click on update wool pricing and we can enter our own wool prices. So whether you have your own prices or you can go onto the AWEX website, I've currently entered an average of a five year pricing there. We update our prices and return to the summary sheet and enter in that proportion of use that we decided upon between merino and terminal size. This table down the bottom here is just showing us what we went through on those previous slides. So basically, if you chose to only use a fibre diameter me measurement or an only a body weight or a combination, all of those results are shown in this table for you to compare. So once you decide on which strategy you would like to move on with, you can return to the data entry screen, select which strategy from this drop down menu that you want to choose, and this tool automatically creates that drafting list according to that strategy. You can download that and either um, put that in a stick grader and manually open a draft gate or put it into an auto drafter or however you like to then allocate those animals into each group. I'd just like to acknowledge here that this tool was funded through the Sheep CRC. Um, so that was a great piece of work there. <laughs> Okay, and in summary, I just want to say don't be caught short. We want to make sure that you have enough use to maintain a self-replacing flock if you are changing that proportion that you made into terminal sire, or at least be prepared and know the impact so that if you know that you will be short of those use, what you will do with that. Basically, if you need to change those percentages, check your numbers, have a look at your structure and ensure that you're going to get the most benefit. It doesn't matter if you are 
um, looking at a single or multi-trait or a single or dual selection strategy, a selection strategy is going to most likely achieve a better option for you. So measuring traits also allows exploitation of that variation that we spoke about before. You need to think about what your objective is. So whether you want to focus on one direction or multiple and how many traits it is worth recording to get that information out. This presentation and the tools that I've covered are not here to provide the answers for you. They are here to promote the thinking about some of the options that you have and the impacts of those choices that you make. Obviously, there are quite a range of factors that should be considered. Um, these are just a few. I will now hand over to Jeff Casburn, who does our sheep enterprise gross margins in New South Wales DPI, and he can discuss some of the more broader issues that might arise. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. I always love listening to uh, your presentation because I'm always learning as well. So good on you. Thanks, Jess. And thanks, Hilary and MLA for uh, uh, putting the productivity and profitability series on and inviting us to speak. Uh, basically, uh, <clears throat> what we thought, Jess and I thought we'd do is we just quickly talk about some other considerations when uh, thinking about joining um, a percentage of your merino flock to terminals. And generally what we do, that, why we do that is because um, the balance between wool value and meat value is changing all the time. And obviously over the last number of years, meat value has been right up there, but so too is wool value. Each year, uh, New South Wales DPI, we put uh, together 10 enterprise gross margins, and we update those each year. And what we thought we'd do is we'd just give you a quick uh, presentation on some of the relevant gross margins, which might help you guys think about um, the dollar benefits or the actual impact to your enterprise when you start uh, changing the percentage of terminals that you might put or join in your merino system. So firstly, we have some assumptions and the assumption that, that we start with all the gross margins is that we've got a thousand hectares and we're running 10 DSC per hectare as a stocking rate across all of them. So what we've got on the table in front of you now is we've got a, a Merino enterprise, which is joined 100% to Merino rams. And we're basically selling the weather wiener lambs at four months of age. And so firstly, what we can see in this enterprise is that the DSC figure per U is 2.32. And as a result of having a thousand hectares at 10 DSC per hectare, we can run 4,310 ewes with the DSC rating of 2.32. If we do that as self-replacing, that means that we're basically at, at approximately 80% land marking and weaning percentage, approximately 1,740 hoggets we'll have, will be breeding. And we'll also be selling each year 761 casts for age ewes. The weather wieners that we'll have to sell, they'll be 1,853, and their age is four months. And using MLA prices, in combination with some prices from Auctions Plus, for meat value and sheep value, but also um, the AWEX for wool value, those weather wieners we valued at $119 each, at four months of age. And this was for 2019. We also valued the ewe hoggets that we would have to sell at $194. And we would have 809 surplus ewe hoggets to sell out of a total of 1,743. We also include some supplementary feed costs through the year. And in this case, the feed cost per DSC was $6.70. And that gives us a gross margin per DSC of $59.62 which is which is a really good result. Now, Jess, could you move to another scenario, please? 
So what we thought we'd do, if, you, if you've got a Marine Apes and Reno Enterprise, one option might be uh, to actually hang on to those wiener weathers until they're 11 months of age or thereabouts, so that we're actually selling them into the light um, domestic trade. And so basically that's what we've done. And so what you can see now is a comparison of the numbers of animals and the prices. So we'll just start at the top firstly. Well, actually, we'll go halfway down the table and we can just see that the age that we're hanging onto those wieners for is 11 months. Because we're hanging them onto them for 11 months, that actually increases the DSC rating per ewe because we've got to feed those animals for that extra period. So if we go back to the top of the table, we can see that the DSC rating per ewe is 2.65. And because we're wanting to run the same stocking rate across our 1,000 hectares, that means that we can only run 3,774 ewes, which means that we're actually only producing 1,500 hoggets each year. And we're only selling cast for age ewes, 667 of them, compared to 761 if we were selling the weather wieners at four months of age. So there's some hidden changes to your enterprise, which you need to account for when you're comparing the profitability. If we go down, um, we can basically see, because we're running less use, we're also producing less weather wieners. So even though we're hanging onto them for 11 months, and we're now selling them for $167 per head, we're actually selling less of them as well. And if we look at the number of ewe hoggets that we have to sell, we only have 708 of those to sell because we're running less ewes per hectare. Still at the same price of $194 a head. So because we're hanging on to those weather wieners until 11 months of age, you've actually got a slightly higher supplementary feed cost across the flock of $9.50 per DSC. And that ends up giving us a gross margin for 2019 of $54.96. So in this case, for these prices of this year, using the assumptions that we have in our gross margin, it has actually um, got a lower gross margin. So yes, we might go to another option now. So this next option that we're looking at is saying, okay, well, we've had a go at finishing our weather wieners, but what would happen if we join 25% of our merino ewes to terminal rams? Now, the first thing that we can see is that the DSC rating hasn't really changed. It's 2.63, which is similar to the 2.65 for if we were to finish weathers, because we're hanging on to all the progeny and we're gonna try and finish those at the light domestic trade. but we're still having to run less numbers of ewes per hectare as a result of that. Because we're joining 25% of the ewes to terminals, we're also going to have 25% less ewe hoggets to, to, um, to either keep as replacements and also to sell excess. So our cast raised ewes is similar to if we were um, finishing the weathers in a, in a Marine H and Reno enterprise. But what you'll also notice is that we're gonna have less Merino weather wieners to sell because 25% of them were joined at terminals. If we look at the U hoggets that we had to sell, and in this case, they're worth $194 each, we've only got 325 of those to sell, because which is 25% less when you consider that there'll be male and female progeny. But what we do now have is 808 uh, terminal or first cross lambs. And we can see that we're, we're actually getting rid of some of them a bit earlier at 10 months of age, and also 11 months of age at a slightly heavier weight of $187.49. We've got a similar supplementary feed cost, but again, a gross margin when we combine um, all these changes is still less than a Merino to Merino enterprise for 2019. 
So Jess, we've just might go quickly to another enterprise. And this is where we have Merino U's and we're gonna join them all to terminal RAM. Uh, terminal RAM. So that means we've got a similar DSC capacity to the Merino to Merino 100% um, where we sell our wieners. And that's because we're not having to run any hoggets through the year. Basically, we're gonna actually have to purchase replacements. So you can see that we're gonna to have to, in each year, buy 980 um, replacement ewes. Now, I wouldn't like to be going into the market in 2020 prices trying to buy ewes because it would blow the cost out completely. <clears throat> But we can also see, because the DC rating of this enterprise is only 2.3, that we would have back up to or close to, it actually would be, uh, I've actually had a <laughs> notice of typo there, it would be 761 cast per age used for sale. But we've got no merino weather wieners for sale, and we've got no u hoggets for sale. What we do have though, is 3,007 or 3,800 approximately mixed sex lambs. And so again, they're going to be at a similar price and age of the previous enterprise. And, but we're also going to have a slightly higher supplementary feed cost. So that gives us the 2019 a gross margin that's a little bit lower again. And so that we can see when we start comparing enterprises that there's trade-offs all the way through it. And it's about having a good understanding of those impacts. Now I've been doing these gross margin enterprises for a number of years now, and I see the, the difference between enterprises moving up and down between years. And that's really to do with the ratio, firstly of wool to meat, but probably more importantly over the last few years is the value of um, having to either purchase replacements or if you've got new hoggets for sale, especially um, you know, coming out of drought when numbers are really quite low. So that's really an important consideration. Now you guys are probably sitting there thinking, well, this is, you know, because we had to adjust the numbers we run so that we're achieving 10,000 DSC for our thousand hectares, what would happen if we were actually uh, below stocking rate? Or we, we had capacity in our system and we weren't really, um, operating at an optimum stocking rate. And that's a difficult thing to calculate, optimal stocking rate. So what we've done is we just did a basic scenario where we haven't, we've just assumed that we're below our normal stocking rate anyway, or like this year, it's a great year, and we, we haven't had to drop our U numbers back. So we've given them the same DSC capacity per U. So we're up with 4,300, um, use on our 10,000 hectares. Because we're joining 25% of those to uh, terminals, we've got 1,300 hoggets to sell rather than 1,100 in, in, the, in the initial enterprise that we had with 25% terminal. We've got the same number of cast for age animals for sale. <clears throat> now where the wieners, we've, we've picked the numbers up of those, 1,374 compared to 1,200. We can also see a slight increase in the number of ewe hoggets we've got for sale, and also the number of mixed sex lambs. So that's punched our gross margin up to $61.27, which is slightly higher than the Merino to Merino enterprise that we've got in this 2019 example. So that we can see there are certainly benefits for the prices in 2019, if you've got excess capacity in your pasture system <clears throat> to hang on to lambs a little bit longer. But like I said, the prices in 2019 are gonna be different to the prices in 2020. So it's really important to try and take a longer term view of what you believe the market trends are when you're working out um, you know, the systems that you're gonna uh, run on your farm. So look, uh, that's as much as I want to talk about at the moment, and I think we could leave it up for questions. Thanks, Hilary. Fantastic. Thanks so much, uh, Jess and Jeff. Uh, thanks so much, Jess, for giving us some uh, practical and 
um, production uh, scenarios around um, what you need to think about when joining your marina used to terminal size and um, there's more than just t uh, joining the oldest age groups that um, you could consider. And uh, thanks so much, Jeff, for putting some economics around that, um, those decision decisions for everyone. Um, I'll just give Jeff and Jess a little bit of a break before I jump into questions and just uh, remind you that these webinars are recorded. They are available at a later date um, on the MLA website. Um, so you can find them there if you want to go back through and um, further sort of look into what Jess and Jeff uh, delivered this evening. Uh, just if you do have to head off now, you will do. You will get a um, a survey that will pop up on your screen as you exit the webinar. If I could ask you to take two or three minutes to complete this uh, survey, it just gives uh, MLA uh, ourselves as facilitators and the presenters an idea of um, the feedback and where we need to improve or um, where you would like to, us to target these webinar. Uh, topics. All right, I'll jump into questions now. Uh, the first one is for you, Jess. Um, does the tool, uh, the Merino versus Terminal Sire tool, allow for the differences in reproduction, wool production, and survival at different age groups? Don't forget to unmute. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Unmuted. Um, so if I go back, oh, well, I won't go back on the screen. Um, so the question was, um, it, it does allow changes between hogget and adult, and then there is a standard adult um, change across time. I will flick back so that people can look at what I'm talking about. Um, can I just go? So, um, you can see that you can change those percentages. You can't change that across each age class. However, if that is what you're interested in, um, the figures are there for each age class. Cause, so you could manually adjust those um, while you're thinking about what's the best strategy. So um, it's not a default, but you could um, work it out from the figures that are on the screen. Thanks, Jess. And I don't know if you mentioned, where are these tools available? Ah, my apologies. Um, if you send me an email, I can send them out to you for free. Um, we're just working on upgrading those to be web-based. So at the moment, I will be emailing those out. So my email address is jessica.richards at dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au. Um, and if you didn't write that down, if you just go onto the DPI website and look under livestock sheep, there are selection and management tools under that and my email address is there. Great, thanks so much, Jess, uh, and thanks for the question. Uh, the next one, unfortunately, is at the other end. Sorry, Jess, um, for it's for Jeff. Um, Jeff, in your scenarios, has the wool cut of the weathers been accounted for in the finished weather scenario? Oops. Look, um, thanks for that question. When, like it all comes down to the assumptions that you're basically uh, going to make in a gross margin. In the scenario that that we've got here, we've basically just shown the the lambs at four months of age, which is in line with the the shearing of the um, of the main flock. So no, we haven't. So what we do is when we value the animals, we try and account for a skin value as well. Great. And the finished scenario, you've shown it at eleven months. What was that, sorry? The, in the finished scenario, you've shown at 11 months of age or? No, no, so at, at we've we've shown them at four months of age with the adult. Yeah. And so they will be sold if they're 10 months of age with six months wool. Great, 
Thank you. Um, and then just a comment from uh, someone in the audience. Uh, in the current market, I would think uh, first cross user making more than $194. And I think you did touch on that, Jeff. Well, uh, no, they're, they're Merino use, they're hoggets. And um, yes, they would be worth a lot more than that. So that, that's exactly right. Um, and, and that's, 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 it's important really to understand the assumptions behind each of the gross margins. And that's why we do them from year to year because it changes significantly between years. And um, yeah, like we said, you know, coming out of the drought and the demand for uh, use is right up there. And I, anecdotally, I heard someone say today to me um, that they'd heard of use making $500, like that's the very top. So that's a lot of money. Um, and, and that is most likely to be um, first cross using that example. All right, uh, unless there are any other questions to come in, that is it for this evening. Um, so again, thanks so much, Jess and Jeff, for jumping on and giving us the presentation. And I think it really worked well with both of you um, combining your expertise for this evening. Um, and thanks everyone for jumping on and tuning in tonight um, and we'll see you in a fortnight's time. Hilary, thanks, could I just Hillary. make one? Thanks. Hilary, I just one other comment. Um, we published 10, the 10 gross margins on our website. So just do a search for a sheep enterprise gross margins and it will come up. But one thing that we publish with the gross margins is a series of sensitivity tables, which you can um, see what the impact of higher wool values or higher lamb values or higher supplementary feeding costs or higher reproduction on what the gross margin will be. Because everyone's gross margin is gonna be different in terms of how they perform on their place. So it just gives a bit of an idea or an option of being able to actually um, look at the sensitivities around the assumptions in each of the gross margins. So individuals can actually say, yeah, well, what would it be if I had 90% weaning or you know, my wool cut's greater or you know, uh, I'm, I'm using better genetics, so I believe my lamb uh, weight will be higher. So, um, yeah, I just uh, want to bring that to the attention of people that are on the webinar, that they're there and the sensitivity tables are relatively straightforward to follow. So thanks, Hilary. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and a really useful tool uh, for those who are sort of wanting to benchmark their business and um, look at where they they sit in terms of um, the the assumptions that are made by the DPI, so um, a really useful tool that's available to everyone. All right, so thanks again, Jess and Jeff, um, and good night, everyone.